Well, good morning, and I greet you in the blessed name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A chosen generation is one who is holy, where they know sin in their life, they do not want sin to remain. They will get rid of sin whenever they fall into sin, because they want to be right with God, and they fear God, and do not want God to be angry with them. A chosen generation is also loving. This is their motivation that will compel them to continue to do what is right, regardless of how they are treated. And they will be abused. They will be falsely accused, persecuted, to a very, very great extent, as church history has evidently clearly revealed to us. But with the love of Christ in our hearts, God says we can be victorious, we can overcome. But we must keep on feeding on the Word of God, because the more you know God, the easier it is for us to trust Him. The more you know the Word of God, the more the Word of God will sanctify you and purify you, beginning with your mind, and then your heart, and then your entire life. For we are a people of God. We are not a people of any nation. We are people belonging to God, that's what it means, owned by God. And therefore, God says to us, I want you to never forget your identity in my sight. The world can't see this. One day they will, and then they will go get the rudest shock of their lives, for this world had always persecuted Christians. Then finally they're going to realize that we have been persecuting the children of the living God, and then they will know how the living God will have to deal with them. If you abuse the children of the President of America for no reason at all, just for fun, what do you think he will do to you and me? He will take us to task immediately with all the power at his disposal. He will make sure that we do not escape. That's what they did at 9-11 when uh, America was attacked, they unleashed the might and power of America against whom they thought, they believed, were the perpetrators. What about us as God's people? God wants us to remember that we are God's people. Let us conduct ourselves as God's people. But just in case we become arrogant, we become proud, we look down on everybody else. I am God's people. You are not. God says, I want you to always remember that you are a pilgrim at the same time. And this is something that you cannot command a person to remember and to see himself. And so you find in the Bible, in verse 11, God said, Dearly beloved, a very gentle and tender tone. Dearly beloved, my dear children, that's how God wants us to understand. That He is appealing to us. And then He used another word, I beseech you, continuously. It's as if God is begging us. Why did God have to use such tender terms to reach out to us? Because this aspect of a chosen generation, that is, He must see Himself as a stranger. And as a pilgrim, he has to come from a heart that is very, very willing. You can't force a person to do something because very often when you force a person to do something, when the person does it with the wrong motive, even though that action is right and biblical and good, it becomes sinful and becomes wrong. God doesn't want you and me to be forced into reminding ourselves that we are strangers and pilgrims, sojourners. One elder asked me, what must we do to increase the number during church prayer meeting every week? And so I answered, I said to him, oh, that's very easy. And so he was taken aback, mm, very easy? I said, yeah, very easy. You want people to come for prayer meeting, we're going to increase the number. Let me give you a secret. But this is not something we do in Pandan, but you can try. From this month onwards, 
right up to the end of this year, put into the weekly this simple announcement. From now, that is the end of July till the end of December, every member who comes to prayer meeting will be given $5,000. I think practically everybody will come. They must not be absent. If they are absent, it must not be more than three times or else you're going to deduct $1,000 from them. I guarantee you they're going to bring their dog to come <laughs> for their $5,000. The message is don't aim for numbers, don't do anything other than the fact that the people who come for prayer meeting, come to church, come for Bible study, they must do so with the right motive. If the motive is wrong, even though the action is right, the action becomes wrong. Why do you think God tells us, God says, I'm only pleased with a cheerful giver. I'm not pleased with someone who does it out of compulsion. It doesn't mean that your gift will not be used by God for the extension of God's kingdom. But you, the giver, will not be blessed. If you did it to please your boyfriend, to please mommy, to please a girlfriend, to please somebody, or because you want to compete with a neighbor, then God says, you will not be blessed. The motive behind what we do is very important. And to be a stranger and pilgrim, God wants us to do it because he wants us to know that he loves us. You are my beloved, and therefore I beseech you. I don't want to command you, he could have, but then what will that result in? People who are forced into doing all their times and God wants to command us for our own good always. But in this particular aspect of the chosen generation, God wants you and me to sit down properly and to literally check and look at yourself. Do you really see yourself as a stranger and as a pilgrim? I think you understand this concept better than me. Singapore has always been my home. I mean, when I was born, Singapore was still part of Malaysia. All nine of us in the family were born in Singapore. Whenever my mom was about to deliver the child, my dad would drive us all the way down from Sramban, that's where we stayed. My dad was a member of parliament in Sramban. And so that has to be our home. But since Singapore was one of the many states of Malaya at the time before they became independent, that has to, the place, Singapore has the best hospital. And so my dad would drive us all the way down, about six to eight hours drive. My grandma has a beautiful big bungalow up on uh, Fifth Avenue, Bukit Timah Road, up on a hill. So that's where we will stay until the baby is born until my mom is strong enough, and then my dad will bring all of us back home to Sramban. And he did that for all nine of the children. And so when Singapore split from Malaysia, my dad decided it is better for us to be educated in the English-speaking way than in the Bahasa, because at that point in time, they were converting the entire education system into Malay. And so my dad brought us all out so I had no concept of this stranger and pilgrim, unlike many of you, who have migrated here as an adult. We're not talking about young children. Young children, you probably won't understand too. But as an adult, you came into this land literally as a stranger. You tried to do your homework. You tried to do your best to prepare everything before your family finally joined you. You may be the advanced party, you look for the house, you look for the school, and if you're a Christian, you look for a church as well. And so you look at the culture, you look at the safety, you look for everything else. But the moment they moved here, you know that you have really burned all bridges. This is now going to be our new home, and you want to begin a new life, and this time as a stranger. Everything will be different. You're going to start making friends all over again. And then you look at this place. Can this really be my home? Is this really going to be my home until the day I die? And then as days went by, you become more and more comfortable with the environment. You begin to experience life 
four seasons. Singapore is either hot or wet. One season. That's why it's so nice. You don't like? You don't like? Singapore is the best place on earth. <laughs> Especially the weather. If you don't like it, poor thing. You don't know what you're missing. You open your wardrobe, you don't have to worry about take out your winter, take out your this, it's just the same. Right? So convenient, you don't have to waste time. Right? And everything is just cool and nice. You just wear shorts, just walk around, it's so comfortable. I'm here just to come in, you go to unrope this rope. And go out, gonna put on again. Go put out, put in, put out, put in. <laughs> Isn't that a terrible, tedious activity? No. No? So after that, gonna put on. They're gonna put on gonna, the shoes and the wear this and the wear that. It's so uncomfortable. Waste of time. Singapore, one pair of slippers, 365 days. <laughs> right? So I come here, this is not my home. I know I'm going back home. So I don't feel as if I'm a stranger here unless I intend to make my home here. And then I will really feel strange because when I go to the shopping center, it's not all Chinese. <laughs> In America especially, when we were there for three years, it was a very strange feeling. There used to be a time when I go to Sunday school, bring my children there, my daughter there, every head of hair black. When we sent our daughter to the Sunday school in the church in America, easy to spot my daughter. Only one black. Right? See, only one black. You go to the shopping center, you look around, all white, you are the only Chinese. You really feel strange because everyone around you, they don't look like you. The environment all around you is so strange and so different. Because Singapore is packed, high rise everywhere, people milling everywhere. When we were in the park that we studied, it was a backwood tiny little town. The place was so sparse, hardly do you find any traffic jam. People are very nice, but you know that they are not one of you. It's different, they speak different. And Dr. Jeffrey Koo and I were having lunch. And so one of our American friends sat down and just joined us. We were having our conversation. Then after we finished talking to one another, he said, what kind of language was it? <laughs> what do you mean what kind of language? <laughs> because he was speaking Singlish. He didn't understand. And so he asked Dr. Jeffrey, what are you eating? Oh, I'm eating pork. I said, what kind of food is that? Pork. <laughs> I sat there, I looked at my American friend, then I spelled out the word P-O-R-K. Oh, poor! <laughs> See, they don't even understand our English. That's how strange we felt. We had to not talk like them. Try to pretend to speak like American or else they don't know what we are talking about. See, what kind of language was it? You know how... Oh, you're a big chick. You know what's a big chick? <laughs> it was really difficult because every time we talk to one another, relax. The moment our American friend joined us, we switch. <laughs> I thought she doesn't know what we are talking about. Strange, we very strange. Everything was, was strange. In Indiana, winter time, snow. Inside the apartment where we stayed, the hinges of the door were frozen. You gotta put on garment just to go out and throw rubbish. It was less than 20 meters away. And it was really cold, minus 20 degrees centigrade. So when we go to seminary every morning, the first thing I did is to brush away the snow from the handle of the car, got in, start the engine, turn on the heater, then I'll spend the next 10 minutes scraping the entire car that was covered with snow, removing all the snow. That was the new way of life. To the Americans, it was normal. The way I looked at them, it was natural. They expected it and they just went through the motion without thinking. For me, every act, every step, everything I did was new. But when it came to the third year that we were there, it was less strange. Not that it was not uncomfortable, I was not comfortable with it because 
the chore of waking up, shivering, the whole car covered with snow, and then you start scraping, and then you try to wash away the underside because they put a lot of salt onto the ground, and then the undercarriage is salty, and then the car will rust. It was terrible. I know. I was so glad that we had to come home at the end of three years. So happy to come home. We saw Singapore after three years while you really felt like the Pope was kissed the ground. <laughs> really, I don't want to go back there anymore. I'm going to spend another three years in that kind of life. That was my closest experience of the strangeness. Other than that, every time, it's only two weeks here, two weeks there, three weeks there, come back home. Holiday, camps, that's about it, that idea of strange. You have it, because it's your life now. You are now in a land that was not yours once upon a time. Or well, you're trying to make yourself as comfortable as possible by buying homes, by buying all the appliances to make your home like a home away from your previous home. And so you now start to have new friends, new way of life. But will you ever, ever forget that you were once upon a time a stranger? And now you are just a pilgrim. A pilgrim is a familiar stranger, a stranger who is now familiar with the environment, with the culture, with the people around him. That's all. And God says, don't go one extra step. God understands when you first arrive, stranger. Now, when did you first become a stranger? The moment you became a Christian. You begin to look at the world with new eyes. That was how I felt when I became a Christian. That morning when I went to the church for the first time in my life, my friend, my classmate in architecture brought me there. I knew the reason why I went to architecture was for two reasons. One, for God to save me. Second, for God to use my time in architecture to prepare me for the ministry. This is only known to me by hindsight. So when I went to the church for the first time, my friend shared with me the gospel. I could not recall and remember what was preached. But what I could remember was my friend seated me down at the back. It was a tiny little house church at the time. Then he asked me that I want to accept Christ as my Lord as my Savior. He shared the gospel with me. I prayed a prayer of salvation with him. And something inside me changed. At the end of the service, I walked out of the house. I felt as if I was walking on air. I look at this whole world with new eyes. Everything became so different. I cannot explain the feeling. Suddenly, the whole world looked so strange to me. Before that, I thought life was just a life where I can make lots of money. So I told you that my dad was a member of parliament. That means we were multi-millionaire. We had many cars, many drivers, one to fetch my mom to the market, one to fetch my dad, one to fetch the children to school. We are maids, one to wash, one to cook, one to look after us. Our house was about five acres in Saramban. And so we grew up playing golf, playing funny things on our own. There was a tennis court, there was a fountain, there was a garden with fountains. Then when Singapore split, we came over. Then within a short period of time, my dad passed away because of cancer. He was not a believer. None of us was a believer. And then very soon, my uncles and aunties sold the house where my grandma used to stay. And then we had nowhere else to go. But suddenly, from the son of a multi-millionaire to nine children, my mom with hardly anything other than her savings, nowhere to stay. And so my eccentric multi-millionaire uncle rented a pink bungalow so that we could stay there because we need a big house for nine children. I was about 17 then, 18 when my dad passed away. I, my youngest brother was about six or seven years old. My oldest brother, oldest sister, I was number four. So I have older sister, older brother, older sister, one year apart, one each. So it was very difficult for my mom. Then I went to national service, got to look after myself, could not share the burdens of national service life with my mom because she had enough burdens of her own to look after nine people without a job, only upon her savings. After I came out of NS, I went to university to do architecture. My mom said to me, 
I only have enough money to pay for your school fees. I don't have any money for your pocket money. You've got to find your pocket money. And so I started to give tuition in order to have pocket money to buy books, to buy material, to buy everything for my architecture. So it was tough, it was difficult for many of us. And so my desire, my aim when I went to university was to make good, work hard, find lots of money, and then help look after my mom. That was why when I graduated as a Christian, I said to the Lord, please Lord, if you want me to go full time, let me work for three years. The reason was my older siblings work hard to support me in my university. I want to do the same for my younger siblings who were in the university. And that's why I asked for three years. And true enough, second year into my working life, the Lord reminded me of my prayer, my promise. And I got a shock on my life. I have forgotten my promise, my prayer to the Lord, but the Lord did not. And so, I struggled for six months. I didn't want to. I thought it was just a flash in the pan kind of a feeling. I used excuses, one after another. At that time I was dating my wife now, Angie. What if she wants to break off with me? Now she is dating an architect. If I tell her that I'm going to quit architecture, and I'm going to be a student in the Bible college, what if she breaks off with me? And the Lord reminded me during my quiet time, Foxes, no. He who loves father, mother, brother, sister, his own wife, his own wife more than me, is not worthy to be my disciple. And so I got a slap on the face. So that excuse cannot stand. Then my next excuse was, I have no home, Lord. I want, why don't you call me after I get my home? Why, why don't you call me after my wife is more established? Then the following night, the quiet time was, Foxes have holes, birds have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. How dare you complain that you must have a house first before you obey me? And so excuses of the excuses all went out the window. And then finally I knew. Either I obey or I disobey. And so the burden was so heavy and I struggled. And for the first time in my life, my love for architecture lost its taste. No more love. Went to work like a zombie because of the turmoil that was inside your soul. You know in your own heart that you are disobeying the Lord. And then, I submitted, and the burden was lifted. I felt like it was in the time when I accepted Christ. The world changed. My life just simply lit up after six months of torrential rain and darkness and gloominess. Then I told the Lord, I told my boss that I was going to resign. I gave him one year notice so that I can complete my architectural project with him in, in Indonesia. So I completed that, then I resigned. But before that, I'm going to tell my girlfriend, Angie. So one afternoon after she finished her work, I went to her office. I was very nervous. But in my heart, I was prepared to break up with her if she says no. And then I told her, and then she said, if the Lord has called you, the Lord has called you. It's okay. I was so happy. I was so thankful to the Lord that the Lord gave me my wife. We have been married for, better not say wrong. <laughs> 29 years. Not once did she ever complain when I'm in the field, when I'm in the ministry. Not once. Thank God for her. It was tough, it was difficult. You think I don't want a good life filled with material luxury like everybody else? I used to. Who doesn't want to provide for their family, for people they love, with a lot of material comfort and things? It's the way we are, the way that God has made us, the way the society has shaped us and molded us. But God says, you are my people. And therefore, as my people, this world must never, never be your home. And in order to make sure that you do not ever, ever regard this world as your home, no matter how beautiful it is, this world is tainted by sin. No matter how glorious God's creation still remains, 
in spite of the terrible wickedness that prevail across this whole globe, you and I as God's people must never, never forget this world will never, ever be our home. That means everything and everyone that you have, that you think it's in your name, they are on loan to you, including your life. God has lent to you your life, your children, your possessions. Nothing belongs to you. And unless and until you realize and understand this by telling yourself, by reminding yourself that you are a stranger and a pilgrim, you will never, never be able to let go of the materialism in this earth. Please understand what God meant. God is very, very clear regarding this. That this life that we have is loaned to us. It is not ours. And unless you and I realize this, you will continue to think that you are a citizen here. And you make yourself so comfortable here. And you become so much like the world. You desire the things of the world. You're going to be obsessed with the things of the world. You think that the life as a Christian is just something of an appendix. When it is supposed to be the heart and soul of every fiber, every ounce of energy that is in you. It should be your soul, it should be your everything. When in fact Christianity is nothing but an appendix. You and I are here by the grace and mercies of God. You and I don't even deserve to end up in heaven. We all deserve to end up in hell immediately the moment we sin. But God did not do that. God saved us. And God now has transformed and washed this sin-sick life of ours with the precious blood of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, so that you and I can be His people. When we were once upon a time, we said so in verse 10, remember, not His people, never were. And by His mercy, we have obtained mercy and we become His people. And God says, if you want to be my people, I want you to know that my people are strangers and pilgrims. Don't make yourselves citizens or permanent residents on this earth. Because if you do, you're going to grip in your hand things that are going to destroy you. And that's why he says, pilgrims and strangers, you must abstain from fleshly lust. Fleshly lust. Now the word lust there simply means strong desires. That's what it is. There's nothing wrong with desires. There's nothing wrong with strong desires. This same Greek word, when it is used to describe the right kind of desire that is not fleshly, that is not qualified by the adjective fleshly desires, they are good. And the King James translators use an English word that is very appropriate. They use the word desire. For example, Philippians 1.23, a very familiar passage. Philippians 1.23, where the Apostle Paul said to the Christians in Philippi, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Remember? And then the apostle said, For I am in a strict, it takes two, I am in a dilemma. On the one hand, I want to remain on earth and to be your pastor, to teach you the word of God. On the other hand, I want to go to heaven, which I know is far better than to remain on earth. And that's what he used. Having a desire, same word, having a desire to depart, that is to be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless, to abide, remain in the flesh, is more needful for you. So this desire to go to heaven, when it is not for fleshly things, it's a good desire. We are people created by God to have desires. But now God says, as Christians, as my people, as strangers and pilgrims, please abstain. Hold yourself off, literally, personally, your own. Nobody can do it for you. You yourself must hold back. This desire says, I want to take these material things. You must now purposefully, deliberately hold yourself back and not take hold of it. It's like, I want to reach out and take this watch of mine. Like these are the fleshly things. The desire says, I want to take this watch. God says, you hold yourself back, hold back. Don't grab hold of it. Now that's the meaning of the word abstain. 
Now we do this on this earth for things that we don't like. We hold ourselves back easily. Things you can't afford, you don't bother. In Singapore, there are a lot of expensive, expensive shops. Some of these expensive shops will definitely have to include shops that sell watches. Some of these watches that they display on the display panel, they are five figures, six figures. Some of them, I'm sure, could be even more, in the millions. That's as near as I ever go to these shops. Because if I look inside, the decor is so expensive. The people who come to serve you, they wear coat and tie. And you know, in Singapore, you wear coat and tie. So they dress much nicer than when they look at me, they probably say, hello, friend. The servant's entrance is behind. I would never go in there. So for these kind of places, you don't have to tell me to hold off. Naturally, I will hold off. Desire for this kind of thing, never in my whole life. Because to me, I do not know what will possess a person to pay 50, 60, 100 over thousand dollars for some tiny little gadget that you put on your wrist. But there are some people who will do that. Okay, maybe they do it for investment or for whatever it is, but I think it is a person who is not a very sound mind. Personally speaking, of course, if you buy one of this one, then I'm talking to you. <laughs> and I'm not apologetic, because I don't think Christians should do this kind of thing. I mean, I watch it just to tell time, right? I mean, this is a few dollar watch. It's just a watch. What are the things that you want to grab hold of? Not everything we know. The things that you have a desire for, and we all have desires. For women will be fashion. For men and nowadays will also be fashion. Because I know that some men, when they pack their bags, their toiletry bags are two times bigger than their wives. <laughs> Isn't that true, husbands? No? You sure enough, every little hair, your eyebrow hair, everything, your mustache, everything all have a tiny little coat for every single thing. And then you have your cologne, you have this, you have that. Oh, you yeah. now men are really a more woman than men. <laughs> you go to those shops that sell all these paraphernalia. It used to be only lady. And now when you walk around, hey, these are for men. And you go, hey, another one for men. So now men are invading into a woman's territory. This is your desire? How to look good. How to look good. That's the problem. You have all this desire? It's an obsession. Spend so many hours choosing what color of dress to match this color of skirt. Hold back. You don't need that dress, don't buy. But it's the latest, no need, you have enough. Hold back. What are the desires? Of course, for men, you don't have to say all the gadgets. Your computer, your camera, of course, your mobile phone. Definitely top on the list. You hold back, and of course, your job, your ambition. This is just desire, all kinds of desire, fleshly desires. God says you abstain. You purposefully tell yourself from henceforth, enough is enough. You want to exercise by all means. It must have a biblical purpose. You keep yourself healthy so that you can be more effective in service by all means. But if you want to keep yourself healthy, you go to the gym, and then you walk out, you walk out, you walk out, and then every time, remember you walk to a, past a mirror? <laughs> what are you trying to do? Who are you trying to impress? There was this bodybuilder who became a champion. Champion bodybuilder. And so they interviewed him. So he was very proud. The people were there, so he sat on the stage, and he, you know, bodybuilder, they wear very tight fitting t shirts, right? And so they interview him and say, Well, how many times have you been a world champion? Well, the same number of times. Please tell us what you do as a world champion. Stood up. You know, all those things, right? Bodybuilder, right? He did all those things. He sat down. Then he, no, 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 tell me exactly what do you do. No, no, tell me. That's all he did. He walked hours and hours with all those bulging muscles. 
No use. He doesn't lift anything, he doesn't do anything, all he does is... <laughs> Correct? So you do the same? You do the same? You keep yourself healthy, keep yourself healthy for what? Not to serve the law, but just to let the body build up. That's all you do. By all means, have a desire, but make sure it has a spiritual significance. Keep yourself healthy. Keep yourself holy. Keep yourself fearful. Keep yourself loving. Keep yourself feeding. But with the purpose of glorifying the Lord and make your life a blessing to people with eternal value and consequences. And to do that, you must never forget that you are a stranger and a pilgrim on your way to heaven. Everything which has walked by, you don't hold anything, nothing is yours at all, because as a stranger and a pilgrim on this earth, nothing on this earth is yours, including your children. How do you regard your church? Pray tell. How do you regard the church? In Nehemiah's time, Nehemiah had to rebuke the people. When God called them back to rebuild Israel, they started building the temple, and then the foundation was completed, and then the Samaritans wrote nasty, untrue letters to the king of Persia, and then the law came, stop building. And then the people stopped building, and they went and built their lives up. They built their homes, they built their lives. <coughs> and then they forgot about the temple. They forgot the house of God. Without the house of God in those days, they could not worship the Lord. Because in the Old Testament time, they worship God in spirit, in truth, and in location. And in the location that God had appointed, and that would be Jerusalem, where the temple was, and every day they walked by, they saw only the foundation without a temple, and they started to get so used to it, and they forgot about it. They were also consumed by building their own lives, rebuilding their homes, their farms, year in, year out, year in, and their lives started to become very, very good, but it was all fleshly. Because without the temple, they cannot worship God at all. Three things must come together when they worship God in the Old Testament times. Right kind of animals, well, they had that. Right kind of people, the Levitical priesthood, they had that too. But he must have the third element that is the place that God has appointed, and that was the temple. Until God sent his prophet to rebuke them, remind them, you worked so hard in your land, but you never, never felt full. You worked so hard to put money into your pocket, but there is a big hole there. There was never, never contentment. You all had your fleshly desires, and it is consuming you. Why? Because you have ignored God. You have forgotten that you are a spiritual people. You think that Israel, the promised land, is home. It is not. You are always strangers. You are always pilgrims on your way to heaven. This is not your promised land. The church is very important. Your homes are beautiful. But what about the church? Yeah, we, are, we now worship God only in spirit and in truth. You are right. But when people come, they look at your church. They look at you. When your church toilet stinks, when your church is in bad shape, and then you invite them to your home, and your homes are all beautifully done, what kind of impression do you think the people will have of you? Seriously, what do you think? What would you think if you come to Calvary Pandan, and then you find that the toilets are all broken down, you flush, you fill a wing down, the thing comes back up? <laughs> Seriously, nobody cares. You want to go to this church, and then when the people invite you home for dinner, and you see their palatial home that are thousands of dollars renovated, all clean and nice and beautiful and pristine. When it comes to the church, the cupboards are run down, there are holes in it, the roof is leaking, the toilet is unusable, everything is such a bad shape. How would you feel? This is supposed to be God's house, isn't it? Yeah, we worship God in spirit and in truth, but this is supposed to be God's house where God's people congregate. And you let it remain in a bad shape while your own homes are all beautified? You put the whole thing upside down. Fleshly desires. You desire more for your own personal beauty, comfort, and distinction than for the glory of God because God's church reflects His glory and the people's perspective 
of their God. Isn't that true? When your lust, your desires are all upside down, it is all carnal. That's the word carnal. You are no longer strangers and pilgrims. You have already become like God. Make yourself a citizen in Sodom. Because this is exactly what the world has become. Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what Jesus says to us before his return. The world will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. You know the account of Sodom and Gomorrah, what it was like? Please don't think that pilgrims and strangers is just an automatic name given to us. It's not a semantic game. This is going to be your mindset. I am a stranger, I'm a pilgrim. It's not just a name that is meaningless. It is very significant and important that you look at yourself as strangers and pilgrims because that's the perspective you need to look at your possessions and the people in your life. You're not going to see many of them again if they are not believers. You're going to pass them through. You're going to have this short moment of interaction with them and then after that it will be no more. How you interact with them can have eternal significance either in hell or in heaven. That's your life. Please don't ever think you're going to live here forever. Please don't think that my legacy when I leave this world is dollars and cents. Then you are a fool. Really, you're a fool because you say you're born again. You should leave behind a legacy that is spiritual and eternal. As strangers and pilgrims reminding your own son, your own daughter, the people you meet in church, that whenever they think about you, my dad is a godly man. My mom is a godly woman. Instead, my dad left behind me a million dollars that ruined my life. Now I am useless and a million is gone. I don't know what to do with my life. You want that to be your legacy? Which is it? Which is it? We are so concerned with buying this insurance, buying that insurance, to make sure that if something happened to me, my children will be taken care of. We are fools. In terms of material things, we know how to prepare. Temporal. But in terms of eternal, we don't know what to do. We have everything here to help us to leave behind a spiritual legacy that lasts for eternity for our loved ones and our friends. And instead, people will think of us and they will say, ah, oh, yeah. Goodbye to bad rubbish. Bye-bye. Can't wait for you to leave this world, my friend. You have lived long enough. You have sucked away all my fresh air. Please go. You want people to think of you? Because some people have this kind of caustic behavior. They go around stirring up problems and troubles, and instead of drawing people closer to Christ, they push people away from Christ. You want to leave behind this legacy? Then don't call yourself strangers and pilgrims, because strangers and pilgrims are very mindful of what they leave behind. They will abstain from fleshly lust. Because they know that this lust is not part of what they now desire in their heart. They war against the soul of the believer. They fight against it. Nobody wants to have this kind of turmoil in their soul. And the only way to get rid of this turmoil is to throw away this fleshly lust. How would you respond if a pristine, beautiful $50,000 BMW got scratched when you went to the supermarket? Then you come back home, you bang people, you're angry, and so on and so forth. Then a wife just lying there on the floor with a big gash. You look at her, what are you doing? What are you, what happened to you? <laughs> Your car got scratched, bang table, get angry. The wife was scratched, what happened? What happened? <laughs> what happened to you? Isn't that true? The car now is more important than the wife. The wife is there with a blood on the gash on the leg. And you won't die, I'll just bandage I the problem. You look my car, no, my car, you know, my car, you know. You laugh. You and I are like this more often than you think. Things that are supposed to be temporal, things that are supposed to be meaningless, you cry and you weep. Things that are supposed to be meaningful, you ignore and you don't care. We are no longer strangers and pilgrims. That is our problem. We have forgotten who we are in Christ Jesus because we have been surrounded by a phenomenon that is so controlling because everybody has the same kind of mindset, citizens on earth instead of strangers and pilgrims. And it has affected us. 
That is our danger, that's our problem. And when you get used to it, you have forgotten how smelly it smells. The stink is gone. I read an article about coroners. You know what are coroners, right? They cut up dead bodies, you know, to find out how they die and so on. So I always wondered, how come these people don't smell the stink? I mean, when you cut open the stomach of a person, oh, the stench must have been terrible. But they look at them, they smile, they talk, after they finish, they just go there and eat their lunch. And so that the lunch the inside, they still eat, you know. Right? How, what happened to these people? I mean, what's wrong with their nose? I mean, how come they can't smell? For you and me, the moment you go in there, ooh, yeah, the smell is terrible, isn't it? For these people, what smell? Then the article explained how these coroners get used to the smell. If you go into a room and you smell something, smell it stinks. Then you rush out and go to fresh air and start smelling fresh air again. Right? That's what people do, right? I can't, oh, I can't take it in water. You'll never get used to the smell. The only way to get used to the smell is to tolerate it, tolerate it and stay there and stay there until what smell? <laughs> Same in the army. National service boys, they don't make. Everybody stinks. And when everybody in the camp stinks, nobody stinks because everybody stinks. <laughs> Until you get into the bus. And then you ask yourself, how come when I sit down, everybody around me stands up? <laughs> you know why? Because I'm speaking from personal experience. <laughs> because that's what happened to me. Nobody sits next to me in the bus. And when I sit down, somehow, at least they don't hold it when it got up. It just got up and they just change seats. In a way, it's good because when the bus is packed, you always have a seat. <laughs> but I learned this because when you are around people who stink, you don't stink. And so when you are around people who are lovers of the world, who are citizens of the world, you become like them. The world that is supposed to smell and stink to you as Christians because it is still covered with wickedness and sin and evil. We don't smell it anymore because we are so used to it. We forget that we have to get out and smell the fresh air, which is the word of God with Christians. That is our problem. Because now we have become PR and citizens and there is no more warring within our soul. If we just allow our flesh desires to control us, to have its own freedom, Whatever my heart desires, just go for it, like Lot. And then he paid for it, the ultimate price. Because at the end of his life, you knew what he had left. He had nothing. God had to literally drag him out, but he could have easily gotten out when Abraham delivered him from his captivity. Remember that incident? Lot fail to remember and realize that what Uncle Abraham said to the king of Sodom. The king of Sodom offered Abraham everything that was inside Sodom. You can keep except give us back our families. That must have been worth millions if not billions of dollars. He was talking about the possessions, the wealth of an entire city. Abraham said, within the earshot of Lot, I do not want to have anything to do with you because he was an evil, wicked, debaucherous king. Just in case one day you will say that you have helped make Abraham rich. I don't even want to take one shoe ledger from you. Lord should have listened closely and learned from it. Sadly, he did not. And he also did not realize that that was the last time that God would open the door and extend his hand out to him. Lord, take my hand and get out. He did not. And the next time we read Genesis 19, he had to be literally held by the angels to be dragged out. He, his wife, and his two daughters. His wife turned around, became a pillar of salt, and died. Easy to take her out of the Sodom, but it was not easy to take her heart out of Sodom. And so they went, stayed in the city for a while, maybe reminding too much of Sodom. He moved up to the mountain. The two daughters got him drunk. And then one by one, the older then the younger slept with him and they became pregnant. And what did Lot leave behind as a legacy? Two boys. I don't know what to call them. Are they sons? Yes. Are they grandsons? Yes. 
One was called Moab. You know what is Moab? Moab means who? Ab is Abba, short form for father. Who is my father? Which is correct. Who is this boy's father? Lot, but his grandfather. Then the second one, my people. What are you? Who are your people? Your people, the Sodomites. You still want to remind yourself that you were from Sodom by naming your son Ami, which later on became the tribe of Moab and the tribe of Ammon. My people. Lord has forgotten that he was supposed to be a stranger and a pilgrim. Uncle Abraham never forgot. That's why he remained there. And the scripture reminded us of how God honored him and used him as an example for us. Lord is an example of warning to avoid, not as an alternative to follow, as opposed to Uncle Abraham. You ask yourself a question. You make yourself a citizen of heaven, and you may be truly be born again like Lord, but what you have lost will be your entire physical life. Let me remind you, Satan is not here to take away your spiritual life, your place in heaven, I mean. He cannot take that away if you are truly born again. But what is at stake is your physical life. The way that he robbed Lot of his physical life. Because that is how Lot will be remembered by the whole world. After that chapter, nothing was ever heard of Lot again. That was it. You want to be reminded that this is your wasted life. Because Lot's life was a wasted life. A life that could have been so, so blessed of God because he was so close to Uncle Abraham. But he refused to listen. And he paid for it a very, very heavy price. Please, learn from Lord's mistake. You look at your life right now. Look at your children. They are not yours. They are on loan to you by God. They are gifts from God. And one day God says, I want you to return this gift to me. Will you? And the only way you can return this gift to me is to bring them to Christ. Otherwise, you are not going to return them to me. Because the only gifts on this earth that God gave to us that can follow us to heaven are our children. And you cannot, because you have been made citizens of heaven by your own fleshly desires. And that has now impacted your children, and now it will take a long, long time for you to erase them from their mind. Please understand, your life here on earth is for Jesus' use. You are a chosen generation by God for God's use to be the mouthpiece of Christ, to be the hands and legs of Jesus Christ. And to do that, you must never forget that you are strangers and pilgrims, and that's why God says, I beseech you. I beseech you never, never to forget this wonderful, wonderful privilege. Therefore, your testimony, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, the word behold there is to inspect, to gaze with eyes open, Glorify God in the day of visitation. Your conversation, your life, every part of your life, among the Gentiles, unbelievers, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, which they will, they may buy your good works. You see, one thing you must remember is the simple, simple, observable truth. You cannot control the pen and the mouth of the Gentiles, the enemies, the, the enemies of God, unbelievers, liars, deceivers. You can't. They will write things that you never said. They're going to put words into your mouth that you have never uttered. It didn't even come into your mind. They're going to do that incessantly, continuously. You must not let them succeed because once you stumble and become like them, once you retaliate, once you stop doing good and you fall into sin, that's the agenda. They want you to respond in sin. That's why God says, your conversation, your entire life, must always continue to be characterized by good works. Regardless, you can control your mouth. You can control your own hands. You can control others. That you must remember. 
And whatever others do to you, they will sin and sin and sin and sin. You don't have to respond in sin. The moment you don't respond in sin, you have been victorious. The moment you react in sin, you have succumbed to the snare of the devil. Because that's his agenda. He wants us to sin. He wants us to stumble and fall into sin. Don't let him succeed. Satan tempts us. But Satan cannot force us to sin. If you succumb to his temptation, it's entirely your fault, our fault. Remember that. And that is why it's so needful and important that the Gentiles will do this to you. As strangers and pilgrims living a holy life, fearing God, loving people with the love of Christ, studying God's word, becoming more and more like Christ, shining brighter and brighter for Christ, there will be resistance. And that is why your testimony must continue to shine even brighter no matter what. The darker the night, the brighter the light. Isn't that true? I share with the people in Sydney PP Church that I like torchlights. I collect torchlights. I think in my home I have about 30 plus torchlights. Different design. Big and small. Some very tiny. Some very big and nice. I like to shine them. I like to play with them. And I'm tired, I want a break from what I'm doing, especially at night, I go to the living room, then I switch off the light, total darkness, then I take out this light, then I shine, <laughs> then I take one that I just bought in Malaysia in the camp in June, I told myself, I'm going to give myself a treat, but this is one desire my hand did not do better when <laughs> it was not expensive, <coughs> Then I look at it, wow, it's like a beam of bright light. You know, just, I can't wait, you know, because my house is a uh, 16 story high, right? 16 floor, HDB flats everywhere. So I like to switch on all the light, and then I beam, you know, 16 floor, and then I shine onto the road, shine at the cars, shine at the people. <laughs> because this kind of light is only good at night, because in the daytime, the sun. Drowns out every light. When I up off with the sunshine, I shine. I can't see anything. <laughs> right? But when it is pitched up, the best. The beam will shine you know, three, four hundred meters, you know. Very nice. You, 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 you don't like this kind of thing? <laughs> you like, ah, uh, uh, it's a man's thing, is it? Ah, we men understand. But one thing I learned, the darker the night, the brighter the light. And this world is getting darker. And when the light shines, darkness will not like you. Darkness will try to suffocate you. But you must continue to shine. You must not succumb to their snares. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Even though Satan may use flesh and blood people against you, you wrestle against principality. So you must pray. You must ask God to give you the wisdom to respond and react in a manner that is Christ-like. You must hold on. You must not let go and fall into sin. Do you remember this incident in Daniel's life? I love the book of Daniel very much. Daniel, as a young teenager, was brought to Babylon. And the Bible tells us his purpose in his heart never to defile himself, no matter what, even if he had to die in the process. He was in Babylon during the first captivity, 605 BC. Second captivity, 597 BC, Ezekiel and 10,000 others were brought to Babylon. And God said to Jeremiah that you will be in captivity for 70 years. And since Daniel was the first captivity, he was there from the very beginning of the 70 years of captivity. So he was a teenager, maybe what, 14, 15 years old, maybe even younger, 12 or 13, we do not know. But he was old enough to know what was right and what was wrong. And he said, I will determine in my heart never to defile myself. And then we came to Daniel chapter 6. The Babylonian Empire had been replaced by the Persian Empire. That means 70 years have come and gone. So Daniel, by this time in Daniel 6, he was in his 80s, maybe 86, 85 at least. And then he was made first president. And so president number 2 and number 3 were very angry. How can this Hebrew... A foreigner now under our kingdom Persian kingdom how can he be made number one when we are now demoted to number two and number three and they were very angry 
And they knew the law, though. The law of Persia was such that even when the king himself had signed something, the king himself doesn't have the power to undo it. And so they're going to find fault with Daniel. And so they scrutinize his life inside out, upside down. And you know what was their conclusion? We can't find fault with him. He was so diligent, he was so capable, he was so honest. The only way we can find fault with him is in his relationship with Jehovah. And that's exactly what they did, which resulted in Daniel ended up in the lion's den. For 70 long years, he purposed in his heart not to defile himself. What it means is, the moment you sin, you have defiled, you repent, you become clean again. That's holiness. What they did to Daniel, they will still do to you and me. Do you have any sin in your closet? Get rid of it. Repent. If you want to be a stranger and a pilgrim, God says, please, abstain from fleshly lusts. Bear a godly testimony. <coughs> Truly, bear a godly testimony. No skeleton in your closet. Seriously, no skeleton in your closet. Get rid of everything by genuine, sincere repentance and take practical steps to get rid of whatever because the enemy will come. They're going to scrutinize you. They're going to find fault with you. If they don't have fault, they're going to manufacture faults. Don't let them stick. Don't let them be genuine. Please, don't let them be genuine. They will try. You can rest assured. You better be squeaky clean or else Satan will abuse you and he will bid his time and wait and wait and wait and then he will expose you and then the bang will be so loud because that's what he wants. Maximum damage to the image of Jesus Christ that you are bearing as a leader. He will target leaders. Because they will make the bigger sound. When a member commits adultery, the sound of that fall is soft. Compared to the pastor, the elder who commits adultery, that sound will be very loud. Watch yourself as pilgrims. Live a holy life. So that one day, by your good works, these people who are God's enemies, <coughs> They shall behold, they will look at you, and one day they will glorify God in the day of visitation. The day of visitation means God will save them by his gospel. That God will visit them, and God will be there to show them that you have been persecuting my children. They love you, I love you. Believe in Jesus Christ. Remember Saul, who became Apostle Paul? God visited him on the road to Damascus. He was there. To hold on to the garments of those who stoned Stephen to death. Stephen continued to preach and preach, and Stephen even prayed, God forgive them. You think all these did not touch the heart of Saul? And God visited Saul. They tried to find fault with Stephen. Thank God they could not. And God saved Saul and turned him to become the greatest evangelist and apostle the church had ever known. That's what your life and my life is all about, as God's people. And I pray and hope that you will now, from this day onward, look at yourself, look at your possessions, look at your family, look at your children with new eyes. That I'm a stranger, I'm a pilgrim. I don't own anything as a stranger, as a pilgrim on this earth. And they are put into my hands for me to look after, for the glory of God. And one day, I'm going to return everything back to God. Therefore, the only way that I can look after these things is to do so according to the scriptures. Material things, use them for God's glory. Don't hoard them. People, treat them as always more important than material. Material, you can lose. It doesn't matter. You can lose a billion dollars. It means nothing. It's just paper. Paper is worthless. But people, don't hurt people. Love them. Care for them. Look after them and show them the great work of Jesus Christ in your life. Won't you do that? Let us pray. Our merciful, loving Heavenly Father, may we never forget, Lord, that we are always strangers and pilgrims on this earth. And help us, therefore, to abstain from all fleshly lusts that have ensnared us the way that it ensnared Lord, may we learn from his mistakes that we will 
not repeat them in our lives. We thank you, Father, for the many, many responsibilities that you have entrusted to us with our possessions, with our families, with our friends and loved ones. And as strangers and pilgrims, help us to regard them according to Holy Scriptures. For things, may we use things and not be owned by things. For people, may we learn to love them, help them, and in times, we may need to rebuke them. And may we always do so constrained by the love of our Saviour and always according to thy truth. Sanctify us, O Lord, by thy truth, for thy word is truth. May every camper make this covenant with thee, O Lord, that we will always remind ourselves that we are strangers and pilgrims on our way to heaven, and help us to encourage others, other believers, that we may together walk on this journey victorious at the end of our lives. Forgive us, O Lord, of all our sins, for Jesus' sake, in Jesus' name we give thanks and pray. Amen. Amen.